how did you meet the delicious, wonderful Pollyanna? I met Pollyanna McIntosh um, for the first time, very, very briefly, yeah. um, on Burke and Hare, because mm-hmm. myself, Reese, Pollyanna, and David Schofield are all in Burke and Hare. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I didn't meet any of them on the set. I knew David beforehand through doing yes. uh, Where the Moon. Yes. Um, I didn't meet Reese until last October. I met Pollyanna very briefly during uh, my ADR session on Birkenhead. Mm-hmm. She came in to do some stuff on the same day, yes. and it was kind of like a little introduction, and then and then um, I think she, she was leaving, and then she left. Um, and then it wasn't until I was... Um, until I was prepping this, we got in touch with her agent, who was really cool, uh, a guy called Lee Morgan. Yeah. Um, and he just said, yep, she'd be totally up for it. And then um, we started emailing, and um, I met both... No, I actually met Pollyanna for the first time at Real Music. <laughs> so I, I know I've heard along the airways that there's some kind of funny story or anecdote or something. Or... She was going to a birthday party. She was going to Mike Hewitt's birthday oh, party. Oh, God, really? Uh, yeah, right, because okay. Mike, Mike, who now is, <laughs> is doing wonderful things at Universal... Um, he he was the spearhead behind the release of The Woman when he worked at Revolver. Yeah. So they knew each other through that. And Mike was already coming to Real Music, which, for those listening, is a, a, a movie soundtrack club night that I run um, every six months or so. Um, yeah. And we'd I'd started emailing with Pollyanna like the day before our last one. Um mm-hmm. And I said, oh, well, you know, she said, oh, I'm, I'm free to meet up on these days if you want to meet for a coffee or something. And so she, she suggested the day that we were doing real music on. I said, well, I'm actually doing this thing um, on the Friday night. You know, if you're a movie fan, you might might want to come along, you know, on track films, whatever. And she said, wait, I'm actually going to that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, what? <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, do you know Mike Hewitt? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, it's his birthday. And I was, I was like, of course, yeah, he's coming along. So she, she actually came up and said hello while I was while I was DJing. And that was, uh, that was the first time I met her. And then um, I think a week later I met with both um, Pollyanna and Reese. And um, I love both of them to death. They're both wonderful yeah. people. Um, and they're, they're brilliant at what they do. So, again, just so, so pleased and so humbled to be working with such great people on there. Uh, on, on on this being my first um, foray into into fiction. How interested Pollyanna dress up? Do you, well, well, real music. For, for real, yeah. No, I'm she did. Apparently, oh, she didn't know that it was fancy dress. Otherwise, she would have. So. There goes my fancies. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but yeah, no, I might get her to the next one. I might get her to the Halloween one. Oh man, come on! Do that, and you definitely got me boogieing. <laughs> Seriously. So, yeah, that's actually probably a good opportunity to plug it. Um, October 27th at the Bloomsbury Bowling Lane's Real Music. So it is cracking. You can find, <laughs> really you can find the information at uh, www.realmusic.com. So, yeah. Fantastic. Basically, I, I love that there's, um, that there's a, uh, a distinct mundaneness about, Brit- about British serial killers. I mean... They always look like the weird guy who lives down the street. Exactly. And more often than not, that is always the case. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sensationalism that's attached to um, to American serial killers, like, yes. you know, Charles Manson, John Wayne Gacy, yes. Ed Neen. And, um, you know, there's... It's, it's never the case over here, you know. Brit, you know, Dennis Nielsen wasn't a cult leader. Um, John Christie wasn't a highly intelligent, mm. you know, Harvard grad who escaped from prison through the ventilation system. You know, there's there's none of that going on. There. You know, it's, it's always just, you know, the the weird guy lives down the street. The, the most sensational, you know, serial killer we've probably had is Jack the Ripper, and no one knows who he was. So you're bloody right. That's a really good point. I mean, but, you know, some could argue maybe the Yorkshire Ripper or Fred West, but, you know, people were interested for, what, a week? And then it was, you know, 
get on with it. But those guys are never really mentioned in the same breath as Ed Gein, Charles Manson, Ted Bundy, Jack the Ripper. So, yeah. so and so it, it was fun watching Reese kind of tap into that. Auditory. He's a handsome fellow, isn't he? It's, it's it's interesting, kind of seeing a couple of the kind of the, even even stuff like the, the main poster. You have got these shitty little lies coming out of a letterbox. <laughs> it's 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 kind of it's not uglifying as such because he's such a handsome fella. But um, and yes, my numbers are. Uh, but uh, it's more a case of that there is this kind of a look as opposed to a big nasty kind of Uber in your face. Wah ha ha This isn't there. How right, do you think yeah. it in terms of English? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, if you I mean, if you look at guys again, like Ted Bundy, you know, yes. is is mainly you know people who are is people who are ugly on the inside. You know, they they can be charming inside and out, but there is that dark place inside them that is yeah. is the monster. So um, so yeah, I think it's, it's it's interesting, and you see that a lot. I mean, American Psycho, Patrick Bateman's one of the best looking guys in the world. It's Christian Bale, yeah. Know? Um, you know, there's there's something interesting about you know having a, a serial murderer who, you know, with a nudge and a nudge and a wink can have you on their bed one minute and hanging up on a meat hook next, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it it's again it disarms the audience because mm-hmm. you think, oh, here's a normal looking guy, and then there's a knife in your neck, so. Yeah, you never, you never know who is who you're, you're living next to. Essentially, and it's like the it's like the BT, uh, BTK killer. I mean, that that guy was like a he he uh, had a had a had a job at the uh, a church, and was like this, you know, a, oh, yes. a, a pillar of the community. Yeah, he was yes. ki- killing you know killing people left, right, and centre. Yeah, you know, Ed Gein as well, <laughs> and um, I can't remember the name, but I think it was. Mary Hogan, something like yes, that. Yes, I think. Uh, so. Yeah, I when she went missing, mm. and uh, the police were, and, and it's like the banter going around the town, and and Ed was in like a, a supermarket or something, and they said, "Oh, I wonder where she is." He said, "Oh, she's in my um, she's in my my barn." <laughs> <laughs> and no one, yeah. they just thought, "Oh, that's crazy, Ed," you know. <laughs> Just being weird, but she was in this fucking barn. Yeah, it was a like it's the one where it was the landlady was hung upside down, wasn't it? The pub landlady. Yes. Yeah. yes. Right. I spent far too long on the internet silly hours in the morning. Um, in terms of this Englishness, I mean, we, we you have the whole kind of thing of you know it's not her indoors, it's him indoors, and we've got looking out of letterbox. I mean, do you think there's kind of any other English sensibility in some ways to this film? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's. Again, without without giving too much away, there's he he is the he's the typical no sex no sex please we're British kind of guy, you know, um, and Pollyanna kind of <laughs> represents the complete opposite of that, you know. I mean, it, one of her first lines in the in the in the script is, oh, you know, I was just I was just next door having a beer, you know, hanging out, and which is like his worst nightmare. But um, he addresses, uh, this is, it's one of the things, I, I wondered whether or not it was too on the nose, but um, it kind of works in, in, in correlation to what happens in the scene. Um, when we, the very first shot of the movie, we, we hear Reese like, kind of list the things that he hates, um, you know, the reasons that he doesn't go outside, you know, because mm-hmm. people, or they, they only live to drink their beer and copulate with each other, they're putrid parasites, all that kind of stuff. So when Pollyanna comes in, we, she kind of throws little curveballs in the mm-hmm. diet at different points that point back to that first opening passage. So um, it's, 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 it was just, it's just a, it was just a lot of fun to, to watch it play out. And to, and to see those guys together. I thought that they would improvise a lot more, but they didn't. And oh, actually, actually came up to me and, you know, asked me if they should do this differently or, or how about I do this? And, you know, I don't think I ever said no once because it was, all, you know, it was always a case of, well, let's, let's do it. If it works, great. And it always did work, you know. So, um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was wonderful in that respect. In terms of... of- Obviously, it's your debut as a, a director for a, for a narrative film. Um, how did, obviously, you're an actor as well. How did acting actually influence, um, you know, the, the directing? 
Well, I, I absolutely, you know, acting was my first love, and I, I love watching actors work and, and and do their thing. And there were a couple of times actually when we were filming um, the scenes with Reese and Pollyanna, where I had to get, be nudged by my my first AD to yell <laughs> cut because I was just so mesmerised. I was like, oh shit, I'm actually here doing a job. Cut. <laughs> yeah. But they, yeah, I. You know, I, I love watching, um, I love getting things out of actors. I like, I like watching them do, try different things. And, um, and I basically said to Pollyanna and Reese from the very beginning, you know, I want you to feel natural about everything that I'm asking you to do in this. So, you know, just think of the script as a template. Don't necessarily think of the dialogue as, you know, it's not gospel. You know, just kind yeah. of do if if need be, do your own take on it. Um, but they didn't. They they practically stuck to the script word for word. If you read the script, there's probably only two things in the film that weren't scripted, um, and one of them is actually one of my favourite moments in the film. So I'm Ooh. you know kind of, kind of glad that um, that we got that in there. But um, in, ter- in terms of me, from my background, I mean, I was just in awe the whole time. There's a wonderful photo that was taken by the Stills guy of Pollyanna and Reese talking in the li- in the main living room, and I'm just sat on the sofa, just looking up at them, starry eyed. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I could do it as well as them. Otherwise, I I would be acting. But um, but it's, it's one of those things where I you know I would never ask an actor to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. So I always, um, I always acted out a scene for if they needed to see what it was I was asking them to do. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was you know, and it meant that I got to play as well. So you know, it was, it was fun. It was fun for me. But um, no, I just I just appreciate how how wonderful they were and and how how much respect they gave me as as a first time director and. Um, you know, and I, I gave it right back to them. I mean, I, I you know, when, when you're a director, you put your trust in a performer from the minute you cast them. Um, and I kind of wanted to put that across, you know, it's like yeah. you're, you're here for a reason and that's because you're damn good at what you do and you two are the perfect people for these roles. Mm-hmm. So anything that I can do to, you know, make this experience more comfortable for you, more, you know, you know, that's what I'm here for. So, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, I'm not one of these directors who, who says, you know, it has to be this way. This is how you're doing it. Yeah. Not stray from this. That's, that's not my job. You know, that's the, I don't think any directors, should, well, you know, some directors are set in their ways, but, um, and they get the results because of that. But, you know, I don't care if, like the person in the catering has an idea I will listen to it and if it's better than what I've got I'll fucking use it <laughs> you know? absolutely in terms of you know you talk about the Fright Fest audience and obviously with the way that you funded this through is it uh, pronounced Sponsoon I think um, I don't know actually I, I just, it's hard isn't it I've always um, just called I, I know Kickstarter is another brand I, I always yeah. as a Kickstarter because you know everybody knows what you mean when you say that <laughs> yeah. I, no, exactly. I think it's Sponsoon I think it is. It looks like it's sponsored me. Like. Yeah, I call yeah. it sponsor me, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. That's like, like, carry on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of that, and in terms of, as you said, this whole idea of a community getting a joke and all the rest of it, how, I, I noticed on, on on that site, one of the things you're saying, if, if people contributed, which of course, thank you everybody who did contribute, you're wonderful. Thank you very um, much. It's uber cool. I noticed that one of the things you've got on it, and I'm going to see if I can skiz down to it so I can actually read it off rather than trying to guess, um, is you were saying if, if people contributed, I think it was uh, a couple of hundred, they could have one of the weapons complete with a blood stain. Yes. What's that prize? How? I'm interested. Um, well, the um, I'm not going to tell you what the weapon is, but um, no, sure. we, we had uh, a mock-up made of the weapon. Um, and it was used, it was screen used on, on in one shot, and uh, Reese then etched his signature in it, and we uh, and we delivered. So that person already has the, the weapon, so they know what it oh. is. Hold it aloft, whoever you are. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> um, 
But uh, it's it's funny because I gave them the prop, and then I I suddenly found myself with the original. So I kind of got a little memento myself from oh. that moment. But again, that that scene is just wow. When I when I watched it edited together for the first time, when we shot it, um, because most of most of the time I was calling the shots from a, a monitor setup in the kitchen, because the the problem with Reese wearing glasses throughout the shoot was mm. you you you'd quite often see reflections of people who were in the room, you know, on the film, filming it from the other side. So we tried to keep as, as, as little people in the, in the living room as possible when we were filming those scenes. Um, but on this particular scene, I, I was in the room when we did it and we went for a rehearsal and, um, and Reese came in, did his thing. And um, as soon as I yelled cut, you heard everybody in the kitchen just like, oh, my God, and and clapping and whooping. And I was like, oh, my God, (laughs) we got it. That's it. That's exactly what we need. Um, And we we, we filmed it about three or four times after that, but it still hurt every time we watched it. Um, And then when I saw it cut together for the first time, you know, it didn't matter that I'd been there watching it five or six times when, when you saw it edited together for the first time. And still watching it now, it's just mm. fucking horrible. It's fucking brutal. So, um, Why the glasses? The glasses I actually... Um, I'd never actually specified that the, the character would wear glasses, but I'm, my costume designer, David Brown, he said, I've got some glasses just in case. And I was like, okay, well, that's cool. Um, I kind of saw him with or without, that's, that's not a problem. But then when he turned up on the first day... He actually brought his own selection of glasses. Yeah. <laughs> and interestingly enough, the pair of glasses that he is wearing in the film are the same glasses he wore in the cottage. Oh. <laughs> a little, um, a little nod there to the fans. But there's, there's again, with regard to to references and stuff like that, it wasn't a case of there were only a couple that I actually put in consciously because there's one of the main sequences in the film i took directly from the brian de palma film sisters yes which i absolutely adore um the film is actually very heavily influenced by um by hitchcock and and de palma um mainly like the dark sense of humor i I never think that hitchcock gets enough credit for for being as funny as he in his thrillers I mean, Psycho is one of the he always saw he always regarded psycho as a comedy you know it's all in there oh yeah you know, mother's not herself today. Yes. Um, so, so it borrowed very, very heavily from that. But there was a particular sequence that I took from Sisters, which is one of my favourite. It's one of my favourite De Palma movies, but it's also one of my favourite scenes in terms of, um, you know, tension. It's, uh, yes. it's a wonderful scene uh, in the movie, um, which I'm, I'm not going to, because if I tell you, it would just give away yeah. the gag. But... Um, as a little nod to the fact that I'd quite blatantly taken this. I mean, it's got a little, it's got, it's got more of a comedy twist in our version. So it's not like I've just plagiarized it scene for scene. Um, but I actually got a little action figure of William Finley from, um, the Phantom of the Paradise and put him on the shelf facing towards the area in which this happened. So it's kind of like, you know, the same actor who was in the movie and who was in that scene that we're, that we're homaging. Um, it's kind of looking over us, so um, so that was uh, that was kind of nice. But there there is some unconscious stuff in there which I, I've looked back and it's 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 psycho. You know, there's there's a line in there where it's um, um, I think I kind of did have an idea of what I was doing, but I didn't realise that I was lifting a complete line from Psycho. But you watch it, you watch it now, and it, it works. It works as an inside joke um, where he's referring to him being a serial killer as his hobby and that his mother used to help him. And she, and he says every young boy should have a hobby. He used to say, which is, yeah. <laughs> he's talking about stuffing birds, but he's actually just out and out saying it, killing people. <laughs> <is> my, <laughs> um, and the last shot of the movie is, is, is quite literally psycho as well. So, um, it, but again, it's uh, it, it's, it's got a double punchline, so it's it's the same, but it's different. So, which which is how I think it, all all of those things should be. You know, you if you if you're going to take something, do something different with it. 
What would you compare it to, uh, you know, the tone of, of the film? What would you compare it to, you know, the other films or, or, or TV series or anything? That is the hardest question I've been asked so far. Um, it's Sorry. very, very <laughs> difficult to pigeonhole it. Oh, no, 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 honestly, you're not the only person who's asked me that. <laughs> uh, I keep, I call it a comedy horror, but it's, I don't know, it's... I mean, it's not like, um, it's nothing like you've seen Reese do before. It's, it, you know, it's for anybody who's expecting something, League of Gentlemen or Psycho Bill, it's, it's not. It's, um, the only thing I could compare it to in terms of, in terms of what you, what you see on screen and, and how it plays out are the, are the scenes in Psycho between Norman Bates and, um, and, Marion Crane. Yeah. It looks like it's got that realist edge to it, which is a really, really nice touch, actually. Yeah, I mean, it, it still played out very different, because obviously you've got Reese, who's this very closed person, mm. and just wants to get this woman out of his house. And then you've got Pollyanna, who's being so in your face, you know. I mean, uh, you saw the picture in the in the press release. You see what she's wearing, that, yeah. that, that bright pink yes. tracksuit. yeah first came on the set when when she first got into costume i just looked at her and i pointed i said yes be like that tracksuit <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean that's that's the only thing i can really compare it to but of course the 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 gags and the you know the laughs are there which you know with with hitchcock it was kind of underlined um no sorry it was more um it was more of an undertone Again, you know, with Psycho, you watch you watch that scene back after you've seen it, knowing what you then eventually find out, and it makes that scene incredibly funny, but in a twisted way. Um, mm. Kind of the same uh, in in this with on Reese's end of things, but there are a couple of gags in there that are just straight up gags. So, um, but um, yeah, that's the only thing that I could really compare it to. I wouldn't say it's as good as that. That's obviously a classic scene in, in cinema and one of the greatest movies of all time. I, you know, I wouldn't dare, you know, try and tread on those toes. But um, <laughs> it's it's as as far as thinking of things that have, that have influenced the project, that is the closest thing that I can relate it to. I think it's really intriguing, actually, because I think when you you know you cast um, Reese Shearsmith, um, especially in the role of a serial killer, and then you know the, you automatically think, okay. League of Gentlemen, Psychoville. I mean, you know, you just can't help yourself. But it's really interesting to hear that um, it's, you know, a different approach. I think it's oh, yeah. really, you know, it's, really refreshing, actually. He, he's completely different to, to any of the characters. I think if he had to, if I had to relate him to any of the characters that he's previously played, it would be, um, I mean, again, it's different, but the closest one I can think of is the librarian uh, who sees Silent Singer. In uh, in Psychoville, <laughs> oh, right. God, now Silent Singer, um, which which again from a, from a fan from a fan point of view it was really fun. I actually asked him on set. Um, I said, "Come on, level with me, Reese. What song is going through your head when you do Silent?" Mm-hmm. And um, he actually told me it was from a piece of music from a, from a pantomime that he saw. But whenever he um, whenever he does the silent singer he's got that piece of music in his head and he's kind of mouthing it and perform- and he actually did the the movement silent singer on set and i completely fucking geeked out <laughs> and I, I geeked out even harder when he um when he he slipped in a, a papa lazaro voice <laughs> which was just you know just like, you know because I, I watched the league of gentlemen when it first aired so i've been a fan yeah. since you know since since the beginning and you know i just, I just feel really humbled and and I'm really grateful to have worked with him and Pollyanna as well because I was a huge fan of the woman. Uh, yeah, and of course David Schofield from American Wealth in London, which we which we haven't mentioned yet, who's got a mm. a very very brief uh, role at the Ooh. end. So, um, yeah, it was it was one of those things where it was, I have to get someone from an American Wealth in London in this. It wouldn't mm. be if I didn't. You know, everybody's expecting it. I can't let anybody down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it should. I, I, I love David. He's I, mean, I loved him in the Johannes Roberts um, film F as well. I mean, he's, yes. And he, you know, he pops up in everything. He's in Gladiator, The Wolfman, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Yeah. Um, he's got a very distinctive voice, and that's why I wanted him. So. Yes. 
in terms of the way, obviously, as, as we said, you know, we, we have all these references here and all these things that people are going to pick up on. Obviously, they've had a hand in sponsorship. How do you feel about the general concept of, you know, the extent to which the fans are getting so increasingly close to people such as yourself, people who are actually involved in the industry, to, to the extent that you are offering kind of bloodstained weapons as essentially a prize for kind of, you know, helping out, as it were. How do you feel that that relationship is going to change the way that people actually view cinema? Well, I mean, the whole thing with crowdfunding um, in general, um, I think that there are right ways of doing it, and I think that there are just downright deceitful and immoral ways of doing it. Oh, really? Like, for example, um, I mean, I, I've, contrib- I, I've, I've, I've contributed to projects before um, that, have, that have taken my interest, um, two of which are showing in the, in the short film showcase, mm-hmm. um, The Captured Bird and The Halloween Kid. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm friends with the filmmakers. I just think, you know, they these are two people that have a vision, um, and it is a vision that appeals to me. So I wanted to help out. And mm-hmm. when it comes to shorts, um, I think that crowdfunding is the best way to get your film made. It's incredibly difficult to um, uh, to fund a short film. Yeah as a lot of people know. Um, When it comes to a feature or something that someone is then going to go on and make money off of it, forget it. I'm not interested in that at all. I just think that that's completely wrong and it just completely negates the idea of, you know, having generous donations plugged into your project to then say, well, thanks for that and I'm now going to cash in on your generosity and get rich and make loads of money and go on to do other things. The right, thing, yeah. Thing, yeah, with, I mean, with, with him indoors, um, people have been lovely, lovely to the fact that they want to see this film, they've contributed to it, and then once it's done the festival rounds, we're going to put it online, free to stream, people can watch it as much as they want. You know, we're not, char- we're not charging any money for it. It's, once, once it's out there, it's, it's the public's, it's not mine. I'm, you know, I don't want to make any money off of this. I've made it to be seen, not to be sold. Yeah. Oh, that's actually really... I know it's actually, but it's actually kind of really nice to, have, you know, want it to kind of, you know, for it to basically be there people, for people to enjoy rather than it kind of just remaining as a property in the same way. And also, if it, you know, if, as you said, in kind of various different press releases, it helps you to get other stuff done. And, well, hey, it still means everybody's a winner, which is a really cool way of doing it. And... Potentially, it means that, you know, the people who want to sponsor individual projects, it means that the audience can kind of, I would assume, guide the industry in the way they want it to go a bit as well. Right, so yeah, people, people can have to that. see the stuff that they want yeah. get made rather than, you know, wait for a studio to, to to turn around and say, well, I don't know, it's a risk. You know, <laughs> every, you know everything is a risk in Hollywood. It's just the, um, it's, it's the unfortunate thing is, I mean, um, you know, it's show... Little, you know, lowercase business. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, without the business, there's no show. So it's, yes. Um, and you know, and it show, you know, it shows with everything that we're getting these days. I mean, yes. Transformers Five, I guess what four is up next, and um, I won't throw GI Joe on that list because I actually quite enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, but you know, it's it, basically it's, it's Hollywood studios just want to throw something out that's already a brand. Therefore, you know, it's not going to be a hard sell for them. Yes. So it's it's nice when when you actually get filmmakers who come along and they want to make something, and and if crowdfunding is the only way they can get it made, then yeah. then great. But I I just think, I mean, having spoken to distributors as well, I know a lot of them are worried about taking projects that are crowdfunded because then where does the line stop as, as to who owns what you know yes. you may if you release something and then you know five months down the line someone who put in a hundred quid to becoming an executive producer yeah. is saying no you know this is 
I'm part of this film as well. I want this, this, and this. You know, so you know, in in legal terms, a lot of a lot of distributors won't touch a feature that has been crowdfunded. But then, but again, it just goes back to the whole, you know, people have been so kind as to as to give you their hard earned money so that you could make this film. Yeah. And you're going to sell it for ten grand or whatever. You know, you're yeah. you're going to make a huge profit on it. I just I couldn't do that. No. Yeah, it seems like such a such a hard thing to to mediate in terms of like a, a feature. So if you're if you're going the you know the crowdfunding route, all, you know all these people chipping in, you know even as little as like a, a pound or, or a dollar. Right. I mean, you know, I'm, like you say that you know the the potential for these, um, you know, legal risks. Right. Like, yeah. Exactly that. And and as I said, you know, a lot, a lot of the distributors have, have cottoned onto that and they don't want to touch them because they, they know that it's, I don't want to say tainted material, but, you know, there's that possibility that someone's going to come out and, and say, well, you owe me this amount of money. Yeah. So, um, this is a very so, yeah. strong thing going through because we do have this very strong mixture, particularly here, of the idea of a business that, you know, PRs and so forth in particular, uh, distributors and so forth are in there you know, to make their mortgage money and it's at the same time something where, you know, groups will go in, you know, people who go to festivals or whatever will get together and do a shits and giggles film and it's a group of friends and it becomes this very different entity. Right. It, it, it kind of splits up and becomes two different things and that can change people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all very well and good. You know, someone could make a feature um, for, through crowdfunding yes. and they could do the festival circuit with it and then put it online but at the end of the day... The sad thing is, a lot of people are doing this to make money. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, if you say to them, oh, we, we'll, we'll give you the money for this film, but we're not going to release it and you're not going to make any money off of it. Yeah. How many people do you think are actually going to take that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, exactly. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's sad. as I said, you know, it's great that people are able to, to have a hand in, in, in things that they want to see made, but... You know, there's ways of doing it, and there's there's ways of not doing it. So. Mm. I think it's I think it's something that still has to be that, that still has a lot more in in terms of development before it's a viable way in in which we can get the films that we want to see made. Yeah. But at the moment, I think in terms of short films, it's the way to do it. And I would encourage anybody who wants to make a short film to go down that route because it worked. We got to make this this fun little project and um yeah. and we're still in budget so you know we, we haven't, haven't gone over yet and i just hope everybody likes it i hope we do we do them proud i hope this is uh the film that that they they wanted to see get made so but it sounds edible even though edible is probably in the context <laughs> of a bit dodgy but it sounds edible <laughs> 